Hello everyone, welcome to the Adoran region. I'm your host Adoran himself and it is Saturday. And on Saturdays my goal, at least for the month of December, probably going to continue this into the next year if I can keep on the schedule, is to play a random mystery game. And as you can see by the title, the mystery game that we are going to be playing today is Detective Butler Maiden Voyage Murder. So this is a game I found on Steam. The link should be in the description below. If it's not, please yell at me and I will do so. Uh, hopefully the music is good. Um, I'm trying to make sure that it's uh, loud enough that you can hear it because I obviously want to support the music and other things like that. But at the same time also hear my voice because I don't recall if this game is voice acted or not. Not sure if it's like Detective Grimoire. So uh, the basic understanding, I'm going to look at the Steam page real quick just to see um, what the game is about. From my understanding though, the game is a basic detective mystery as you can tell about a murder, obviously. So it says, follow Detective Butler and his sidekick Gilli Gilligan, like uh, Gilligan's Island, as they solved a locked room murder during a haunted uh, cruise ship's maiden voyage. Can you solve the mystery before Detective Butler reveals the answer? Interesting. So this is a very visual novel-based story. There's not likely to be too much that I'm going to be doing. Um, it's just a story, and I like, I'm a big fan of visual, game, visual novel games and uh, story-based games like this. I don't mind uh, not really having much of a puzzle sort of role. I love those type of games, um, but I'm, I'm perfectly fine with visual novel type games, and I think that's what this is supposed to be. So, um, hopefully, because I'm trying to adjust my headphone volume, because the music can get a little loud at times. Hopefully it's not too bad. Let's go play a new game. And get underway. The Misadventures of Detective Butler. This is a work of fiction. Name, characters, places, and incidents are either products of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously. Any resemblance to people's is coincident. Okay, so it's not voice actor, at least this part isn't, so I will get started. On the dark and rainy streets of London, a crowd stands huddled together under umbrellas. In the middle of their circle lies a body. A stab wound to the chest makes it clear. This person has been murdered. And with this, I've solved it. A man wearing a trench coat and fedora emerges from behind the group, and they all turn to face him in shock. Ooh, this music. Yeah. Who was this man? Where had he come from? You solved it? Sir, please do tell us what you know. I say, you can't have possibly done so. This here is what the bigwigs call an impossible crime. Those men from the yard can't wrap. Okay, so this is, uh. Oh, is this Scotland Yard Scott? If those men from the yard can't wrap their heads around it, then surely a commoner such as yourself. Hold it. I don't. I think this is it. Hold it. I may be an amateur. But that won't stop me. Because I get a real kick out of solving these impossible murders. As if the man's words hadn't phased them in the slightest, the crowd does nothing to stop the man from touching the dead body. The man reaches into the corpse's pockets, smirking once he realizes what's inside. Yep. I think this is a tech. Just as I thought. If he had these tools on him when he died, then I definitely know how it was done. Um, if I may politely ask, isn't there a problem? It's been raining constantly for the past three hours, but as you can see, there are no footprints on the ground here, save our own. That's what makes this crime impossible. I find it hard to believe someone could stab this man and walk away without leaving a single footprint. There was a second victim, wasn't there? Killed in an impossible manner as well. Found dead in his study, right? How did you know that? We haven't told anyone. Never mind that. Let me first explain the other victim. Then I'll get to this one. Right. Please do go on. Uh, I assume this is still a detective, so... Think back to earlier today. When the master was found in his study, the door was locked and a servant had to open it using her key. Then, upon inspecting the room, you all saw, you saw that all windows were locked and his only key to the room was hidden inside his desk drawer. That's right. That's exactly what happened. Alright, I'm probably... If it's not distinct, then I'm probably just going to do my normal 
man and female voice, I guess. It's possible, I say. A true locked room murder. In the morning, while the master was out walking his dog, the culprit approached the door to the study. He then took some, out some tools and unscrewed, unscrewed the hinges of the door. That's how he got in without using a key. I also know how to speak. Then the culprit plopped some cyanide into the master's tea, which the poor fool carelessly left sitting out. That explains why the room smelled of bitter almonds. Yes. It may be true the room smelled of almonds, but... I think I forgot about the sealed windows. The culprit took apart one of the frames, making sure the window itself remained locked. Then, from the outside, they reattached the frame as if it had ne never been touched. Same as the door. Uh, and so that's how the master was poisoned to death. Uh, what did I give the doctor advice? But you still haven't explained the most important part. Who is the one who carried out such a devilish deed? All of us gathered here have solid alibis. The culprit? You're surrounding him. The amateur sleuth points to the nearby corpse. I say! Was the master's brother this whole time? What? If the master was to accidentally die, the inheritance would be his for the taking. But when he escaped out the window and climbed onto the roof, that's when his plan went horribly wrong. The master had seen all this coming and concealed a knife-throwing trap on his own rooftop. I'm sorry, what? So our culprit became the victim of a second murder. And our victim becomes our second culprit. Hold on. There's one flaw with that theory. What happened to the knife? Hm. It was made with uh, made of ice, so by the time anybody found the body, it had melted without a trace. The crowd was speechless. Everything had now been revealed to them by this unknown amateur. You can thank me later. I just can't pass up an interesting puzzle. But that's my style. If it's not interesting, I won't bother solving. Ciao. The man fades into the darkness. The crowd is satisfied with this explanation of the two recent murders and no longer need the aid of the detective who happened to stay the night in their mansion beforehand. This nameless detective, who suddenly appeared out of nowhere, was more than capable enough. He had matched his wits against the real detective and had constructed a theory that suited the facts perfectly. The only question that lingered in that overconfident amateur's mind was whether or not this theory really was what the book's author had intended. Huh? Are you telling me that all of this is just a story? Oh my gosh, what a way to start it. Walking out here like you're a god and then turns out it's a book. The man, now sitting in a modern-day bus stop, flips to the next page in his book. Meh. My explanation is way better. With a disgusted look on his face, he closes the book and impatiently folds his arms. Welp, I'm bored. Should have brought some more books with me. Yeah, you're at a bus stop. You're at, time out, you're at a bus stop and you've read through the entire book? I'll have to find something else to entertain me now. Another boring day. At least, so far. It's the middle of July and we're going- oh, this is probably him. It's the middle of July and we're going on a cruise. It sounds fairly normal, but I'm not too excited about it. Never saw the point of one, really. But my father insisted I go with him, so here I am. How much longer until we get there? Shouldn't we be at the dock soon? This cart ride is making me sick. Up. Oh, nope, never mind. Ignore all of that. That's Gilligan. Hey, Gilligan, you feeling okay? You look bored out of your mind. Ah, I'm fine, Dad. Are we there yet? I guess I can use that voice, because my main character's voice is a bit deeper. Yeah, almost. You see the seagulls out there? That tells you we're getting close. My father points to several seagulls flying around the nearby ocean. There's actually a story to those seagulls from a long time ago when my family used to live here in California. Well, I'm glad we know where we are. Back then, both my father and mother lived here, near the place these seagulls are flying around. My mother really loved animals, so she would go to see them whenever she could. The two of them often saw those birds hanging around near the beach or harbor. The seagulls must have left my father with a lasting impression. 
He told my mother how they reminded him of his favorite TV show as a kid. The one about some people shipwrecked on an island. Hmm. I wonder what show that is. And that's how I got my name. Gilligan. I've grown used to it by now, but being named after a fictional character sure was weird at first. That said, Kavana was a pretty strange name, too. Maybe he just runs in the family. Yeah, Galvano? I... I know the Gilligan reference, obviously. But Galvano? I'm not sure about that. Anyway, at long last we find a parking spot and the car goes silent. Since we're finally here, I'll stop my complaint. Choo. I unlock the door and step onto the pavement. A cool summer breeze greets me as I stretch my muscles outside. In front of me rests an enormous cruise ship. I hadn't heard of it, but supposedly it's top-notch. That's why my father booked a vacation here. The day marks the beginning of its maiden voyage, the first voyage a ship makes. So I'm left wondering how a cruise ship can be known as top-notch without having made a single trip. Are we bringing Titanic references in here? The ship went by a different name a long time ago. Well, can't remember it, but they refurnished the whole thing, too. But it's almost like it's brand new. I get it. So it's a high-class ship that's been completely redone. And we'll be the ones to experience its first cruise. How'd you find out about this? Believe it or not, I'm friends with the captain. <laughs> you know, company connections and all that. Working at... I can't see his ties. At GG. Oh, please tell me his last name also starts with a G. That'd be amazing. Oh. Yeah, so, so he told me right away when he finally got enough money together to start up the cruise ship again. I see. I guess being the CEO does have its perks. Yeah, obviously. Being a CEO is typically better than not being a CEO. Speaking of CEO, my father is the CEO of a rather large company. It's an insurance company, so to sum things up, my family is filthy rich. But I mean filthy rich, I mean I'm buying everything. Steam discounts? Forget it. Uh, Yu-Gi-Oh cards? Give me the meta decks. Pokemon cards? I've got every booster box. I don't even open them, I just keep them there. I, I just don't know. Oh no, I have all the TVs. However, I don't actually do anything for the company itself. At the moment, I only have a high school diploma, and I'm to begin coursework at a prestigious university. I call it Prestigious University. Afterwards, I might be able to get something done, something productive. For most of my life, I've been known as a slacker, so I'm probably not. You know what? I relate to this guy, except the whole rich and influential and wealthy thing. I mean, you know, the regular parts of his life I relate to. I have a high school diploma. I am in a university, so I guess that counts. I guess that's what happens when you've been spoiled. Oh my gosh. Ashamed that my high school GPA was under 4.0, my father pulled a few strings and got me accepted into his preferred university. Ooh, this is starting to hit me hard. High school GPA below 4.0. Well, I actually don't know, because my high school didn't do the 4.0 scale. They did it on a scale of 0 to 100. So, you know, if you get a 96 in the class, or you get an 82, and then you average them out, and yada, yada, yada. So, uh, I don't necessarily know what my grade would have been if it was on a 4.0 scale. Probably not a 4.0. Yeah, he totally cheated the system there. What a nice guy. He wants me to run the family business or whatever. What a nice guy, cheating the business. Yeah. To become just like him and take over the company someday. And to do that, he'd want me to get into the best school possible. I have no choice but to go along with his plans. I don't know what I want to do anyway. Maybe I should become a doctor or a lawyer. Settling on my father's dreams is as good as anything, I guess. It does feel a little depressing knowing I have no clue what I want to become, though. But if it can't be helped, it can't be helped. The, the motto of a procrastinator. It can't be helped, it can't be helped. My thoughts are interrupted by the footsteps of an unknown person. Mr. Golder. A tall man approaches us, wearing a jet black suit and glasses. Yeah, that's me. Did Jack send you down here to pick us up, as I asked? Correct, sir. And you are Gilligan? Yep, I'm Gilligan. Understood. Follow me this way, please. The man leads us through the various security procedures. The custom people screen our luggage as they do with everyone and allow us onto the ship. Thank you for your cooperation. The cruise will begin shortly, but the ship will remain stationary for the time being. So please, make sure everyone in your party is here before departure. Right, I'll make sure everyone's here. Take care. The man in black leaves, returning to monitor the outside of the ship. Hi. Um, I don't know what type of voice she's gonna have, so right now my initial voice is gonna be. Simple. I'm probably gonna tweak it. Hey, Galvano, you made it! 
We were almost late. An attractive young woman comes running towards us, waving her hand at my father. Am I supposed to know who she is? <laughs> well, I'm here, aren't I? No reason to worry, my dear. Oh, and are, are you Gilligan? She points her hand at me. Yep, Gilligan Golder. Nice to meet you. Oh, both of them have the GG names. Good game, good game, bro. Eliza Jones. Nice to meet you, too. Your father's told me a lot about you. <laughs> I suppose he does like to brag. I can only wonder what, if what he's saying about me is good or not. That's right, you two haven't met before. I told you I invited all the company executive board members here, didn't I? Eliza's the CCO. What's CCO? Oh, thanks for the answer. Chief Commercial Officer. And you, Gilead? Huh? Uh, I'm not a company member. I've never even seen the inside of the building. <laughs> someday you will, someday. He's turning more and more into the judge from Ace Attorney. Eliza turns around, waving at two more people I haven't seen before. Actually, another thing about it, I'm probably going to have the non-clear voices probably going to keep that as my voice, just because it's kind of difficult to know if who's talking. So Eliza turns around, waving at two more people I haven't seen before. Are these the other company members? <sighs> you run too fast, Eliza. There's no real hurry here, you know. Although, considering it's Galvano, it wouldn't have been too surprising for him to miss the ship. Hey, hey! I might be getting a little slower in my old age, but I'm still Galvan. Underestimating me would be a careless mistake. Ugh, says the person who missed his flight to California. That's the reason we ended up so close to being late here again. But we did get here in time, didn't we? I guess so. And that's all that matters in the end. Uh... Ooh, so... I study economics, I study behavioral economics, and I have a minor, or technically doing the minor but it's complete in uh, business administration so I'm pretty sure from all the experience that a CEO should not be talking about it, like get here eventually I don't know maybe it's a real lax company <laughs> oh are you Gilligan I was wondering when we get to meet you how would ooh is that an I or an L you want maybe chief operating officer Blythe Calico Chief Financial Officer. My type of person right there, the Financial Officer. It's a pleasure to meet you, Gilligan. The two of them stretch their stretch out their hands and I comply. Nice to meet you both. Sorry if I'm a bit more boring than my dad's story to leave you to believe. <laughs> oh, come on now. We've just met you, but I bet by the end of this cruise we'll have lots of fun memories. I hope so, too. Do you like games, Gilligan? Uh, yeah. Who doesn't? Got the Pokemans and the Yu-Gi-Oh's and the chess and checkers and Risk, Monopoly, Life. What other games are there? I don't play Fortnite. I don't do, I don't do those type of games. Anyway. Of course. Then perhaps we should play a little icebreaker game to get to know each other better. I can tell you all about Gilligan. You see, when he was a little kid, he... Hey, 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 hey. There's no need to embarrass me. I'm good. You don't need to do that. You know, maybe we can save this game for later. Gilligan probably wasn't expecting to be bombarded with questions. <laughs> yeah, that's... The ship suddenly shakes and I jump back in response. We must be ready to take off. Eliza giggles, but I can't help that I get scared so easily. There's a reason I don't like engine noises. If I answer, answer one of those icebreaker games, that reason would probably be the thing I tell people. However, it brings up some bad memories, so I try to avoid mentioning it whenever possible. I try to block out that part of my memory whenever possible, too. Thinking about my past makes me sick. My father approaches one of the suited men and asks him something I can't hear. Then, the two of them approach our group. Uh, please follow me. At Mr. Golder's request, I will guide you through the ship on a short tour. It won't take very long. Five of us follow the man into the interior of the ship. Cool, we get to check out this cruise line here. Hopefully there's there's a bit of background noise in the back. I'm not hopefully that's not coming in on the recording. Um, yeah. Welcome aboard the ship. Today will be her first voyage since 1962. That's a while. So double click apparently goes through the entire thing. That's cool. The ship has has been completely refurnished, although the layout remains exactly the same as it was 50 years ago. 
The first deck is off limits to passengers, as the engine room, boiler room, and employee rooms are located there. Please follow me around the second deck. This door leads to the dining hall. Originally, large parties were held there, complete with ballroom dances and performances on stage. We will do our best to recreate the original atmosphere by having performances of our own. The tour continues until we finally reach the fifth deck. For a second I thought it, wasn't, it didn't look like much to change, but I can see the difference. Mr. Golder has requested four rooms for you on this floor. The guest rooms are twice as large as the ones below this deck. They all contain a bedroom, sitting room, balcony, bathroom, and closet. It's a full ordeal. So, uh, which rooms are ours? Rooms 502 through 505 are the rooms you selected during reservation. They are all next to each other along this wall. Here are the car keys. The car keys. The man holds up four car keys. Each one of the, I said car. Card keys. Each one has a room number distinctly marked on them. If you lose any keys, you may come to the front desk and ask for assistance. The maid assigned to your floor will help you. One last thing. The sixth deck can be reached via the stairs at the end of the hall. From there, you'll be outside on deck and you can reach the captain's room as well. Are there any remaining questions? Then please enjoy your stay. If you need anything, we will be at your service. Alright, peace out. The suited, man, the suited man bows before exiting down the hall. Today has been a rough day for speaking, apparently I've messed up a bunch of times. He goes upstairs, presumably to the captain's room on the sixth deck. And I emphasize numbers because I think that's my biggest issue. Alright! Everyone will meet up in this hallway for dinner around 6. I've also reserved VIP seating and asked for the best cook they have. It'll be an amazing dinner. The other company members nod in agreement, saying their farewells to us. Then they go into their separate rooms. My father and I will be staying in the same room. That was the last minute addition and all other rooms were taken, so it worked out like this. Luckily, there are two beds for us to sleep on. For that same reason, there's only one key to this room. It's horribly inconvenient, but I heard most cruise ships are a pain, so I'll deal with it. We enter the room. My father walks over to one of the beds, setting his luggage down. I do the same on the bed across the room. We begin unpacking, using the dresser opposite our beds, opposite the beds to store our things. Near the dresser is a plasma TV as well as a closet. Hey, hey Gilligan, did you see this balcony over here? The view's great! My father walks onto the balcony, taking a good look outside. Uh, yeah. I pay no mind and open the doors to the bathroom. Oh, hello! Suddenly, I see a girl standing in total shock. She looks about my age and is wearing some kind of uniform? Oh, I don't know why I'm doing this. Ah. That was a terrible scream. <laughs> the girl jumps back, frightened at the sight of me. Uh, it, so sorry? Still shaking from nervousness, she doesn't respond. What's going on over there, Gilligan? My father finally looks over and sees the girl cowering behind the bed. What the? Not even an hour into the cruise and you're already making women cry? Gilligan, the heck? Get your act together, boy! What the? Hey, hey, hold up, hold up, what? I, I, I didn't do anything! I don't care where the girl came from. You could be an alien from outer space for all I care. Now apologize to her. But I don't even know what I did wrong! How many times do you think I knew what I did wrong when I apologized to your mother? Ooh! Ooh. He's spitting straight facts right here. Oh, don't drag her into this. Please, stop. It's my fault. The girl stands up, wiping her tear-covered face. She makes an awkwardly forced smile, probably in an attempt to smooth things over. You see, cruise ship maid shouldn't be seen cleaning the room. We were supposed to do all the cleaning while the guests are away. So, when I heard you two come in, I got scared and hid. I'm sorry. <laughs> don't worry about it, miss. Yeah, don't worry about it. In fact, I think it livened things up around here. It, it did? It did? Then as an employee of this ship, I am glad to have made your cruise more enjoyable. After looking a bit flustered, the girl takes a minute to regain her composure. Well then. I should probably be leaving now. I still have a few rooms I need to clean. If you need me, just call. She waves her hand, almost like a salute, and dashes out of the room, the door shutting behind her. Alright, now what's up? <laughs> well, wasn't that interesting? 
already met a cute girl. Hey, hey, hey. 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 Yeah, yeah, okay. Good girl. Real fun. Uh, yeah, yeah. That incident finally over, I stepped into the bathroom. Oh, so she left a keyring in here. She must have forgotten in her in her hurry. It has a good number of regular metal keys attached. Guess I should do the right thing and return them to her. Or not. I leave the room, hoping to return the keys to that maid, but she's nowhere in sight. Nearby, standing in front of one of the doors in the hallway, is a man in a trench coat and fedora. Who is this person? He isn't anyone I know. Nor is he another company member or employee, so he must be a normal passenger. I can't quite put my finger on it, but a guy like him seems out of place here. Maybe it's that goofy-looking outfit he's wearing. I don't know what you're talking about. I like the outfit. Um, what are you staring at? Oh, uh, nothing. Looks like you need something. Spit it out. H have you seen a maid? She left your keys in my room. Hmm. Yeah, she's cleaning my room at the moment. Kind of pissed me off being so inconvenient. And then, can you give these to her? I raise the key ring in the air, dangling, dangling it in front of me. Gives me a questionable look before swiping the keys from my grip. You're awfully trusting of total strangers. A bit too much, in my opinion. Don't worry, though. You can trust me. I'll return these keys for you. I've had people tell me that before. I'll keep that in mind. Thanks. I walk back to my own room and knock on the door to be let inside. <sighs> this cruise ship really has some strange people on it. Oh, I'm gonna head out to the bar. What about you? Uh, I think I'll just watch television for a while. See what's on. Alright. Remember, we'll meet up with the others in, for dinner huh? in the hallway at 6.30. Don't be late. Right, I won't. Have fun. My father leaves the room with a somewhat disappointed look on his face. What, you wanted me to go to the bar with you? I don't... That sounds like a terrible decision considering I'm just out of high school. I'm sure he wants me to do something other than watch television in here. Excuse me, I know the cruise is out there, but we literally just left. Yeah, I gotta see what type of shows are on, bro. Can I see the NFL schedule, okay? My my team is uh, struggling. But I don't really feel like doing anything else. Even when I try to live up to his standards, I always mess something up anyway. So I might as well relax and enjoy myself at the very least. I look through the balcony screen door. San Francisco still in plain view. I really like the artwork. I know it's not supposed to be like particularly clear or anything, but it's really nice, and the music in the background is really good. I really enjoy this so far. It's really fun. The ship hasn't yet departed. Soon enough, the coastline won't be visible anymore, and we'll be separated from the land by several miles of water. A few days, and we'll be back to our daily lives with this, as if this vacation never happened. Time sure does fly when you're having fun, huh? I definitely agree with that. I have that feeling all the time. Chapter 2, Between Truth and Happiness. Cool, um... You know what, since it's separated by chapters and it's been about half an hour, I will end this here. Uh, I think it was... There we go. Save right there. Go into here. That was a, a right click. So I can save. And we shall... Let's see. Go to the title screen, I suppose. Awesome. So that was chapter one. This game, as I mentioned before, is a very just story-based game. It's a visual novel. There's nothing really too crazy or difficult about it. It's just a story, but I like listening to stories, and I hope this one has a really good one. So far, it's doing a pretty good job of exploring the different characters, the two characters in particular, Mystery Man and Gilligan. Um, and I really like all of the other characters as well. Hoping to uh, figure out what's going to happen in the future. I'm excited to find out. So. Thank you very much for watching and supporting the Adorn region in any way, shape, or form that you do. And until next time, ladies and gentlemen, take care. You know, Gilligan, I have a voice like this that's kind of like a judge in a different game.